We're thrilled to have this morning's um, speaker uh, as the kickoff or, uh, of this year's Business Breakfast series. For those of you who haven't been here before to one of these, uh, we're really excited that you're here and we hope you'll come to the next one, which happens to be on February the 23rd. Uh, students reminder for sign-up sheet if you haven't signed up and uh, the community visitors you don't have to sign anything just enjoy <laughs> we're really happy that uh, everybody's here my name is Jim Bunn and I'm the vice president for institutional advancement and um, this series is really uh, special because it's one of the times where we really get uh, prominent accomplished community members in the room at the same time with students so that you uh, students uh, really are, are about to hear someone who's done some amazing things in his field. And uh, before I talk a little bit about our speaker, I just want to say that uh, on February 23rd is our next one. We have a um, pretty exciting topic, but just to show you the range of topics, we're going to go from creativity and uh, creative preneurship to the world of private investigating. So uh, our next speaker is here, Greg Alba, and we're very excited that uh, he'll be here on February 23rd. I also want to uh, acknowledge the, the, uh, the school. Just briefly, getting community members here on campus is very special for us. Uh, our largest, you may not know, but our largest single discipline and major on campus is the business school. And we have the Dean of the Business School, Bill Solva, here. We also have the Academic Chair for Undergraduate here, Mr. Phil Rothman, uh, who are very excited uh, and supportive of this and, and, and responsible for getting the, uh, the students here. So thanks, many thanks to both of them. Additionally, in this little space, right across the hall is our gallery, our art gallery. And I say this because many of you have not been on our campus before. We, uh, we're celebrating our 10th season here of amazing art exhibits that range from students to rodent. Uh, and in the room next door, or two doors down, the big room that looks like our boardroom, um, that's called the Jaeger Room. Take a, take a look, there's a catalog uh, on the side of the men who, and women who made America great, the industrialists. There are the railroad magnets and steel magnets, and these are signed, uh, they have a signed document with the original signatures in there, um, and, it, and it's like a walk through American history and development. So it's pretty exciting. So we like to say that we're, the Concordia is a small school making a big impact on every life we touch because our size allows us to, to nurture good relationships not just with the students, but also with the community. That brings us to this morning's speaker. Steve Landsberg is a very unusual uh, guy because uh, besides being so accomplished, he's a terrific guy, has a very unusual background, and I'm kind of dancing around because I don't want to steal any thunder. Um, but, but I hope that everybody here will feel as uh, inspired by his story as, as I have been, and we are thrilled that that he agreed to, to come speak and kick off the series. Um, that the, the, his world is advertising and creativity, but, it's, but creativity from the advertising world um, is pretty exciting <coughs> because uh, it's how messaging about products and services reach us and how we sing jingles and, and how we relate to products and how we think of them and how we register it with the, the purpose of boosting their sales and their market share. So with that, I turn it over to you, Steve, and thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? All right. So, uh, well, thanks for all coming this uh, early hour. Um, so first, I have a question for all of you. How many of you have ever had an idea? Raise your hand. <clears throat> Okay, good. I knew the answer to that when I asked. So we all have ideas and we're all creative. The issue becomes when we have an idea that we think is dumb and we brush it aside. Or someone says, hey, you know, that's a good idea and then you don't do anything about it. Or sometimes we find ourselves 
coming across an idea that we really like and then you say, gee, you know, I had that same idea. I should have done something about that. So the difference really is uh, between the thinking and the doing. And um, as a creative preneur, uh, I've always had to kind of think it and do it. That was my job. And even before I started my company, Grok, um, I had to kind of do that day in and day out. It wasn't always easy. Uh, there are obstacles, complications, distractions, um, sometimes just a lot of mixed communication. There's an expression you have to take, uh, you have to turn messes into messages. And, uh, but looking back, I actually did my best work under the most challenging circumstances. And I'm going to show you some of those examples. And in doing so, I'm hoping that I could somehow inspire everyone here to have, to, <laughs> to inspire their, your own inner creative preneur. There's a saying in advertising that uh, jobs are short and careers are long. And I'm living proof of that considering I had about 13 jobs over my 35 year career so far. And uh, so in order to get through 35 years and 45 minutes, I structured this talk as a question and answer. Except I'm going to ask questions that I thought you would probably want to ask me. Um, the first one is, what are the qualities of, of a creativepreneur? And they are, among a few, inspiration, determination, optimism, and resiliency. And I think resiliency is especially important. Uh, two things shaped my resiliency. Uh, one was my parents. And um, my parents immigrated from Poland after World War II. They were Holocaust survivors. My dad was in the Warsaw Ghetto. He uh, survived six concentration camps. My mom uh, didn't look Jewish, and she had false papers. And she worked as a maid in a beautiful castle. Unfortunately, that castle was uh, controlled by an SS officer, so she lived in fear for all those years. So applying that to advertising, I figured, what's the worst thing that's going to happen to me in advertising? So what did I have to really complain about? The other thing that um, had an effect on my ability to be resilient is that I have failed repeatedly to win the Powerball jackpot. <laughs> but I am determined to keep playing. <clears throat> Another question. Why did you name your company Grok? Uh, Grok means to communicate with deep empathy and to understand someone or something profoundly or intuitively. So for a communications company, we thought that was very relevant. And we liked the kind of strangeness to it. And it's also uh, from a science fiction novel called Stranger in a Strange Land, which is actually very appropriate to working in the advertising business. What exactly do you do? <clears throat> well, technically, I'm what they call a copywriter. And copywriters work with art directors. And together, we come up with ideas that, as Jim is, was explaining before, sell our, sell our clients products or services. What inspired you to start your own company? This inspired me. <laughs> Financial crisis, crash of 2008. My inspiration, I needed a job. I had been laid off from a big advertising company, and I knew finding another full-time job at the same level was going to be very difficult. So I figured, well, while I'm doing that, maybe I can see if I can start my own company. How'd you get started? Well, it was very gradual. There wasn't any big explosion or anything like that. Um, I had gotten a call to freelance at a large agency. And I called an art director that I knew, and it turned out he wasn't available. So I called another guy I, kn I had known, and he had been the person who had hired me at a company called Saatchi and & Saatchi. And I would talk to him and get some advice, because he was freelancing as well. And I wasn't sure about you know, what to charge and how to go about certain things. So he was available. And we had never worked together before. I mean, I had worked for him, but we never actually sat down and created advertising together. So this two-month, um, I'm sorry, this two-week job actually turned into about five months. 
And during that time, we realized that we got along very well. We were able to generate a lot of work very quickly. The people at the company were liking our work. And so all that was going well. But within that time, we were also very kind of amazed at how this large company was operating. Uh, they were understaffed. They were unorganized. And we really felt very often that clients were being underserved. In fact, one day while working on a project, the head of strategy came to the office on the way out to a, a meeting. They had to fly somewhere. And we were handed a two-page document. And we were told, you know, here's this brain dump. You guys are smart. You'll figure it out. And Todd and I looked at each other. It's like, all right. The door shut. And I turned to Todd and I said, you know, this is crazy. We can do as bad a job as these guys. <laughs> and that was the inspiration for starting Grok. <laughs> Nothing wrong with having modest ambitions. So we started networking and talking to different people in the business to see who we could possibly partner up with, like on the production side or media side. And one of uh, my contacts uh, was, a, was the president of a media company. And he said he had, actually, he had a client who was looking for an ad agency. So um, Todd and I felt that we needed someone to round out the creative part and to be an account to work on the account management side. And uh, I knew some people, and Todd knew some people, and we met, um, he had worked with somebody named Julie, and Julie had been the uh, head of account management at a very large agency. She had global experience, she had strategic experience, she was a head of strategy at one other job, she had CEO experience, because she had been CEO of uh, uh, the San Francisco office of Saatchi. So very, very highly qualified. We had dinner one night and talked about this potential new piece of business. And um, you know, we talked about our vision of providing small clients or not so small clients with senior management to, run, to work on their business day to day. So uh, she said she'd pitch the business with us and, and would see what would happen. And she wasn't about to quit her day job where she had run her own little um, strategic marketing service. So we pitched this company called Amerifit, and they sell nutritional supplements like um, Culturel, which is uh, a probiotic for digestive health, Estrovin, which is for menopause, Azo, which is for urinary tract infections. I mean, this is very sexy, glamorous <laughs> stuff, okay? <clears throat> so, I remember talking to the CEO of the company, and I asked, well, what are you guys looking for? Why are you putting your account in, in review? And he said, well, we've got this great campaign, and it's really great, and we have this great stuff. And I um, said, well, if you don't mind my saying, why are you up for re review if everything's so great? And he goes, well, I just feel like the agency is always sending these juniors, and there, it feels like there's a limo waiting downstairs with the meter running. So I said, all right. Well, Julie, Tan, and I had no work to show as Grok because we didn't really have an actual agency yet. So we went to the client and talked about our experience, and we showed some work from our past, and we discussed what we thought one of their competitors would, would be doing. And we positioned ourselves as big agency talent in a small agency package. We'd be the ones working on their business day to day. There'd be no juniors and no limos. So we got an assignment for Estrovin, and it was really just to redesign a newspaper ad that the other agency had tried to create based on a TV commercial. And it really wasn't very good. So we came back with some ideas in about a week. And they were so grateful that it was almost pitiful. I mean, it was just we did something that a junior team would really do. And they were so happy. And they said, oh my god, this would have taken the other place three weeks, and it wouldn't have been as good. So I said, fine. <coughs> Well, um, by the way, the previous agency that they had worked with was a subsidiary of the company that Todd and I had been freelancing at, Small World. So um, Julie, Todd, and I worked out of our homes to avoid overhead. We called Todd's apartment on the Upper East Side the, uh, the what do we call it? <laughs> we call it the, um, the factory. 
And Julie's loft in Chelsea we call the showroom and that's where we would have clients come down. We were having a lot of fun and Julie decided, yeah, you know what, kind of like working with you guys. So she put out some calls to some potential clients. And we started getting projects from companies like Polycom, who make the speaker phones, um, and Nexus Shampoo. And sometimes we didn't even meet the clients. Sometimes, you know, and they didn't really care whether we had offices or not. And this was another piece of inspiration for me. Came across this cartoon. <laughs> That's the great thing about technology. It really didn't matter. We were doing things that, you know, they, they never knew. So, um, the other thing is as we started getting assignments from outside, that assignment on Amerifit started growing. Um, Amerifit was sold to Martech. Martech was um, bought by DSM, which is a very large uh, company based in the Netherlands. And with every change, we kept getting more and more brands within the portfolio. Um, it was, became known as iHealth. So after two CEOs, two CMOs, various clients going in and out, uh, one day Julie's loft was so overcrowded with clients, uh, we realized we had to get an, an actual office. And even the client said to us, enough already. Well, you'll be our agency of record. You need an office. Get some staff. We'll fund it. I said, great. So in 2009, as banks were failing, as the economy tanked, and as the global economy crashed, um, Grok was born, and which proves my earlier point about circumstances. The best of times can be the worst of times. It's not quite Charles Dickens, but you get the idea. So another question I thought you'd probably ask is, are you going to show us some work? And yes. So <clears throat> on the very day we signed our office lease, Julie got a call from a former colleague, actually somebody used to work for Julie, and she was now the, uh, in marketing at VMware, which is a very large um, technology company. They do IT infra infrastructure, cloud computing, mobility, things I really didn't know that much about before we got the assignment, so we had to learn fast. So without getting overly technical, um, VMware created or pioneer the technology that allowed for cloud computing. Which you probably, have, any, you, have you heard of cloud computing, everybody? You in the back, you've heard of cloud computing? Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we, were, we were talking to CIOs and IT professionals, very senior people, and the audience is very literal, and also the, C, the CEO of VMware said, I don't want to see any cloud imagery. So we were kind of working on this for a while, and it was kind of hard for us. And we realized that when we had visited uh, VMware, everybody there had whiteboards, you know, these things. They were all over. And there wasn't one conversation anybody would have without getting up and drawing on a whiteboard. And when you'd go through the offices, which were incredibly beautiful, you'd see algorithms, formulas, <coughs> recipes, to-do lists, smiley faces. And uh, we thought that actually could be the inspiration for us to tell a very complicated story. Here's, here's an ad that we developed. So there's something about there's public clouds and private clouds and virtual infrastructures. And how the heck are we going to do that? Well, the answer is VMware. So this was a, uh, the, one of the first ads we created, which became a global campaign. Um, it ran for a couple of years. And uh, we liked it because it really didn't look like an ad. It just kind of told a story. And when we tested it with CEOs and uh, CIOs and IT uh, people, they, they immediately got it. So we, we tried to understand their language. Um, the next iteration for VMware was uh, what they call the Software Defined Data Center, which, again, is uh, you know, very technical, but it's every company has data centers. And they're filled with hardware, which is very expensive. So in order to do more things on that hardware, you revert to software, which is much cheaper. And they're otherwise known as applications. So we tried to show how 
VMware added value to companies with lines like turn your data center into a profit center and virtualization has saved businesses billions. Here's what we're going to do to save them billions more. And this evolved to another approach which is running now which is based on the one cloud, any application, any device promise. And um, a recent study showed that VMware's awareness in cloud has increased about 40%. The goal was 6% year over year. And the other thing to keep in mind is that VMware spends a fraction of what Microsoft and what IBM runs. So the fact that we were able to kind of take a challenger brand, even though it's a very large company, it's still a challenger brand in relation to other people or other, or other companies. Um, now for something totally different that we're doing at Grok. This was the first commercial we did for Estervin. <laughs> Can you say this about menopause? <laughs> All natural estrogen is the supplement you <coughs> turn to most for menopause relief. <laughs> And here's another commercial that's running now. Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. Hot flashes, moodiness, my weight. It's like the invasion of the body snatchers, except it's my body. Who do I have to know to get it back? Only Estrovin's variety of formulas help safely relieve all your symptoms. Safe, trusted Estrovin. That voice is actually the CEO of Grok. Uh, we used her voice for uh, some of the test commercials, and they liked it. And it's kind of a way to save money for the client. So you do what you got to do. Um, and I never really thought I would know so much about menopause. And if you have any, <laughs> if you have any questions later, you feel free to ask. Um, the tipping point for Grok uh, really was Zycam. And, um, Zycam is a homeopathic zinc-based cold remedy that could shorten the length and uh, severity of a cold, but only if you take it within the first 24 hours of your first symptoms. So it's a very complicated story. And I'm actually proud to say as a creative person that um, we won the business on a strategic idea. We came up with this idea of creating a new category of cold medicine called pre-cold medicine. Now it sounds familiar, but there was no term called pre-cold. Um, we thought it was such a good idea that we created a, what we call a pitch video to sell the idea to the client. And here's what that looked like. You can wear pre-washed jeans, drink pre-sweetened tea, hear a pre-recorded message, buy a pre-owned car, there are pre-approved loans, pre-arranged marriages, pre-assigned seats, preconceived notions, pre-flight plans, preschoolers, and pre-teens. People have premarital sex, prenatal exams, and get prenuptial agreements. You can study prehistoric times, live in a prefab house, or a pre-war building, attend a pre-trial hearing, launch a pre-dawn raid. You can be preoccupied watching a pre-game show while eating a pre-packaged meal. There's a preponderance of pre-words, and now there's a new one, the pre-cold. That first sniffle, tickle, cough, itch, and ache that tells you a cold is coming. Any medicine can treat a cold, but only Zycam can treat the pre-cold. Only the pre-cold will make Zycam different. People will stop Zycam in their medicine cabinet, office, car, briefcase, pocketbook, locker, knapsack, file cabinet, and desk drawer. And people will look for Zycam in the pre-cooled section. Well, there isn't one yet, but there will be soon. Zycam, go from pre-cold to no-cold, faster. So that actually won us the business. And we also found out that no other big agency had, one, come to them with a strategic idea and had even bothered to do any kind of video for them. So we thought that was kind of fun. Now, uh, this was actually adapted to, uh, for retailers. And um, 
there is a commercial that we created. We actually won the business, but we really, really didn't have the campaign for them. We had a couple of ideas going on, but we developed this one. Oops, sorry. You can. Here we go. That first sneeze, <coughs> you have a pre cold. <laughs> the first sign of a long cold is coming. Take Zycam now, a completely different kind of medicine. <laughs> we had to show that monster was still alive at the end because otherwise the lawyers said that would show that we eliminated the cold, but we couldn't say that legally. So some of you might ask, what's involved in creating a commercial like that? Well, we actually did a making of video that's about three minutes long that I think will explain a lot of things. So let me show you that. When Rob first came to us, he was very clear that the pre-cold notion was absolutely the best synthesis of why I ever made inside here. We came up with a concept called the pre-cold. My creative directors came up with the notion of you don't catch a cold ever, the cold catches you. We wanted to figure out a way to um, sort of bring the idea of a, of a cold to life. Steve and I were working on it, the inside of you don't catch a cold, but a cold catches you. We took that sentence and literally dramatized it in the commercial came out of that. We started thinking about, you know, how to demonstrate a cold catch in you. We thought a little more about, you know, this expression of you get a monster of a cold sometimes. So it kind of came together of creating the cold monster who's out to catch people who exhibit that first sign of a pre-cold. When Grok came to us with the cold monster and with this creative idea, we loved it immediately. But what I love even more is with each step process. So from the beginning story war through the animatic phase, through the building of the cold monster, and now we're getting ready to have our commercial air, it gets better and better. We chose uh, Legacy really based on Rocky's recommendation. We looked at his real Rocky was a fantastic director, a long history of, of great work. The reason why I wanted to do this is because creating characters is what I love to do. My belief is that to do effects, yeah. uh, <laughs> CGI, it doesn't look out of quality. One of the other reasons we went with Rocky is that Rocky wanted to get as much of the action in camera, where other directors wanted to rely more on CGI. When we talked about how to actually achieve the effect we were looking for, he recommended Legacy, and based on that recommendation, we looked at their work and realized that they are first-class Hollywood operation, and when we found out all the other movies and all the special effects they did, we realized that they're a great choice. The first visit that I went to Legacy, got to see the way they go through the process, and I had seen what they had done for other places, and I, so I knew what they were capable of. But I think it far exceeds our expectations, just the expressions and the ability to make it feel alive. What they perfectly captured was the notion of, some, of a monster that's lovable. I think my favorite part has really been seeing the cold monster come to life and how real he looked, his facial movements, and I think he's going to be perfect to get across to consumers what they need to avoid. Um, but at the same time, he's endearing. I love all the discussions and the nuances that I think people don't even appreciate in, in an ad, in a really well-made ad, that just make the product that much stronger. I really enjoy that. <laughs> so, um, that commercial cost about $900,000, which is a very good budget, and it's a, it was a big production. But in the process of that, we also, the, the Legacy also created what they called a walk-around costume that could be used for promotions and events. Now, the, the cold season runs for about four or five months, 
And the client had asked us to, you know, come up with some ideas of what could we do to sustain awareness outside of the cold season. So thanks to the entrepreneur or the creativepreneurial talents of some of the young people at Grok, we basically made a bunch of in-house videos. And these are some of them. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, did I bring the room down? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. So between 2009 and 2012, Grok went from three partners working out of our homes to 25 employees in the office that you saw in the, one of those videos. And um, we went from zero revenue to 9.4 million and to about 75 million in billings. So that's a three year growth of 1,007.3% and we are very pleased with that. And also, um, thanks to Grok, um, which is in our seventh year, it's become my longest continuous job in advertising. Which brings us to this question. How did you get into advertising? Well, it all started when I was about 12 years old with this advice from my Uncle Henry. Don't be an artist like me, be a commercial artist. I didn't really know what that meant, but um, my Uncle Henry was my mother's brother, who was a painter. He uh, immigrated from Poland, and he was actually very good. But he was a real bohemian. He liked to paint and drink and smoke his pipe. And, uh, but he didn't make a lot of money. So his uh, wife did. Fortunately, she ran a pharmacy. After uh, high school, I went to Trenton State College for a couple of years and then decided that I wanted to transferred to uh, an art school and pursue um, art direction. So I went to the School of Visual Arts to study art direction. Now you might be asking, hey wait, didn't you say you were a writer? And I am. I uh, took a class called copywriting and realized that I enjoyed writing more than I did all the technical things that involved art. So um, before going into my final portfolio year, I ran into the head of the media arts department and he said in passing, hey, Steve, how you doing? And I said, well, I'm not really doing that well, Richard. Um, you know, I'm not really getting better. I don't know how to get better. My teachers are telling me my work is great, but I've got, I'm looking at five other ideas that are exactly like mine on the board, and I don't know, you know how to get better. I'm going to be graduating next year. So he said, is there any, are there any teachers you like? And I said, yeah, there's one guy named Frank. And uh, Frank was in advertising, and he was painting now, and he, took some, he, he taught some classes and also some night classes. And I only took his class because he didn't give homework. He, he did everything in the class. So you would you'd come in, he'd give you an assignment, you work for an hour, then he would critique everything. So he said, well, you know, if you like Frank and he's up for it, why don't you take an independent study with him, and you can complete your portfolio credits that way. And I said, Really? You could do that? Um, you know, what about the rules? What about credits, all that stuff? And he goes, no, you just solved my problem right then and there. And I learned a lot about following rules. 
and sometimes rules can follow you. So I went to school at Frank's 27th Street Loft, and I would show him work while he was painting, and if I went up to him four or five times for a critique, that was like four or five weeks of school. So I accelerated, and uh, I got better fast. And this was one of my favorite ads from college. This is what real cowboys think of anyone who pays $35 for a pair of jeans. <laughs> Keep in mind, $35 for jeans back in 1980 or 79 was a lot of money, considering jeans can, you can buy jeans for nine, 10 bucks. Um, I graduated in May 1980 with the BFA and I won the Rhodes Family Award for Outstanding Achievement in Media Arts, named after Silas Rhodes, the school's founder. Now, it doesn't exactly make me a Rhodes Scholar, but <laughs> for a middle-class kid from uh, New Jersey, that was pretty good. So um, my portfolio got me a job at what was, at the time, considered the best agency in the world, and that was Daldane Burnback. And um, it was filled with lots of Frank's former students, and actually, Frank wound up working there as well and uh, made really great connections at the School of Visual Arts, which brings up a question I wanted to ask the students here. Are you taking full advantage of the connections you have at this school? And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's an amazing collection of accomplished and caring people in this community from business, finance, uh, uh, media. So, you know, if you're not networking and finding out who people are and reaching out to them, then you're not taking full advantage and it's how you could be more creative entrepreneurial right now. But enough about you, back to me. Um, <clears throat> can you talk about your career path? Well, the first 15 years was all about building my creative credentials, doing the best work I could, solving clients' business problems and being looked at as somebody who was responsible and rational and calm and could also win awards because back then winning awards meant that um, you can get raises and promotions. So here are some highlights from those early years. Um, at DDB we had an opportunity once to do a Volkswagen commercial. Our supervisors came back. They said all the work was killed. Um, they had been working on it for weeks and would we like to work on it? So being a junior copywriter, it's like, my God, we've got an opportunity to do a commercial. That's fantastic. Uh, when do you need it by? And they said, tomorrow morning. So great, this was about 6 p.m. So the second shift was starting. And this gets back to my, uh, what I said before about doing best work under the worst circumstances. So it was around 4 a.m. in the morning and, and the assignment was for a, um, the VW Scirocco, which was a, a cool sports car. It was fast, exciting, fun to drive. We were trying to come up with all different ways of trying to explain that, and then we realized that about four in the morning, you know, it's just too hard to explain. Maybe we were better off not explaining it at all. And that came to this commercial. This was an ad for Stroh's Beer. I know it says Shiv is Regal, but it started out as a Stroh's Beer ad, but we didn't think it was appropriate for Stroh's, so we were very creative, penurial about it, and we said, hey, you know, we've got Shivas as another client, so let's just make it for that, and uh, we managed to sell it. And actually, Bill Burnback liked this ad a lot. Um, the next commercial was inspired by a song by Chuck Berry. It was for the Volkswagen GTI, which again was an exciting sports car and fun to drive. Usually when you buy the rights to a song, you have, in the business, you have studio musicians recreate that song. But I said, you know, why can't we get Chuck Berry to redo his own song? And everybody looked at me like I was crazy. It's like, you're going to get the, the, the king of rock and roll, the legendary Chuck Berry to re-record your song? Are you crazy? I said, well, I just seen a special on him, a documentary, and he really looked like he could use the money, frankly. <laughs> so 
even though I was a junior writer, I was very insistent with the senior producer that she at least go and try to reach out to him. And she did, and she got in touch with him, and long story short, we flew down to, we, we flew to St. Louis, Missouri, rented a car to Berry Park in Wentzville, Missouri. Uh, we had a suitcase of cash with us, literally, and I spent the day with Chuck Berry. And so, uh, here's that commercial. Um, the next agency I worked at uh, was called Shy a Day, very difficult place to work. They were proud of this motto, if you can't be bothered to come in on Saturday, don't bother to come in Sunday. <laughs> and to, uh, let me tell you, they were serious. This was a campaign we did for Frangelico Liqueur, which was, um, looked very dark and syrupy in their, in their dark bottle. We thought it's actually very light, so let's show the, let's show the liquid. And we talked about the ritual of relaxation. It says, take the phone off the hook, draw the curtains, play some music, something soft. Now you're ready for Frangelica. Um, sometimes advertising can be art. And this is a case where art is actually advertising. This is a Jeff Koons painting. He basically took our <laughs> Frangelico idea and did paintings from it. Uh, I was not cut in on any profits. Um, the next commercial I want to show you is after Shy Day, I went to a place called Wells Ridge Green. And Wells Ridge Green had created a, a campaign for the Ad Council anti-drunk driving effort called Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk. I had nothing to do with that campaign, which I did. But my assignment was to re-edit an existing commercial and do a pull-out of an existing ad. We had about, I don't know, a $15,000 budget, $15, budget for that, which wasn't much. But in reading the, uh, some stories about drunk driving and some articles, we realized that more often than not, it was the innocent victim that was killed and the drunk driver lived because they were too drunk to realize what they were doing. So we thought maybe innocent victims would be a more powerful reason to intervene when your friend is driving drunk. And the client agreed. So for the cost of re-editing an existing commercial, we came up with a campaign that became one of the most successful in, ad, in uh, the Ad Council's history. I can just get it to work here. Say Merry Christmas. <laughs> Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah, yeah lots of stuff. Yay! Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Get your horse hey. Do something cute. You're just gonna sit there and grin. If you don't stop your friend from driving drunk, who will? Do whatever it takes. And then again, from that early period, um, when working on Midas, we had been working for months. There were teams after teams working on a uh, campaign for Midas car repair. Their strategy was cars don't have problems, people have problems. It makes a lot of sense, but it was very hard to execute. Um, we decided that, you know what, ultimately, it's just about nobody wants to get ripped off. And during this time, there were a lot of stories about car, uh, car repair ripping people off. And we just said, screw it. We were just tired of getting all our work killed. So we asked the clients if uh, they had any letters, because you can't just say you're honest, you have to prove it. And they did have letters, uh, really good ones. And here's, uh, here's a spot that came out of this campaign. Oops, sorry, keep doing that. Well, actually, I can't seem to find that. So let's just move on. Anyway, that mighty spot grew the business substantially. We were very proud of that. So the next question is, how do you go from writer to creative director? Well, a creative, a creative director's job is very different than a writer's. It's not just about coming up with the idea. Your job is to help other people come up with ideas. 
Uh, you have to lead, inspire, you have to set strategy, you have to clear obstacles, um, you have to create trust with your clients, and you have to create <clears throat> a culture and an environment where great work can be done. And I thought I was ready. And I also felt like, hey, I couldn't be worse than any of the other creative directors I had to come into contact with. Some were terrific, but others were not. So Ogilvy Toronto was looking for a creative head, what they call a, a chief creative officer. And I used to visit my Uncle Henry in Canada and in Toronto, and I thought it wasn't such a strange land. And the job offered management experience and international experience. And we were out growing our apartment on 13th Street, so I figured, what's 10,000 blocks north going to do for us? <laughs> and I also figured that if it didn't work out, I could have a great excuse. <laughs> so after New York interviews, I flew to Toronto with my wife, Sheila. They interviewed her, too, over a very nice dinner to make sure that she really wanted to make the move, and she did. In fact, after I took the job, it was made very clear to me that they had really hired Sheila, and that, uh, to quote one of my colleagues, we love Sheila, you just came along with the package. <laughs> Ogilvy was a highly respected agency in Toronto, and their work was smart and logical and strategic, but it was a little quiet, and I wanted it to be more visual and more impactful not at the expense of strategy, but to bring that strategy to life. I also knew that media and production dollars was, were going to be a lot less, but smaller budgets require bigger ideas. Um, for Jaguar Canada, they were announcing the uh, new, more powerful engine in the uh, XJ8, which basically looked like an XJ6 sedan. The team came back with some clever headlines, and, but I didn't feel that really demonstrated the, the new car. So I had read that uh, the Jaguar Leaper was one of the most uh, recognizable icons, and I suggested, why don't you try to use the Jaguar Leaper to tell the story? And this is the ad they came back with. So the Jaguar actually turned into uh, some Ken Lions. Uh, the next ad was for Midas Canada, which um, was a promotion for uh, break jobs. And uh, usually these are schlocky little newspaper ads. Um, so we started winning awards and attracting a lot of positive attention, and my creative department and my colleagues started to think that, hey, maybe this guy was up to something. But our biggest breakthrough came in the, in the form of a campaign for Timex Canada to sponsor Olympic athletes. They wanted to communicate their support, uh, and it was really an assignment for a low-budget newspaper ad, and we turned it into a low-budget multimedia ad, campaign, actually. So this was a, um, here's a commercial that we wound up doing. <laughs> this is a print ad based on that. And this was another, we did a, a series of these. Um, <clears throat> the campaign won 8 out of 10 gold medals at the biggest award show in Canada. And in fact, every team at the agency had won an award that night. Timex went on to win Can Lions and other international award shows. And time flew. Uh, after three and a half years, Ogilvy's creative, uh, Ogilvy Toronto's creative ranking rose from 17 to 3. Uh, I became the second highest ranked creative director in Toronto, in Canada, I'm sorry. And business actually grew by 50% over those three years. So it was a great uh, experience professionally and personally. In fact, the guy who hired me there is up in the corner, Ryan. Um, and we loved our time in Canada, but we felt if we didn't go back to the US, we never would. So I was offered a job as co-chief creative director of DDB New York, or DDB Needham, which had been Doyle Dane Burnback. So it was my dream job come true. Um, <clears throat> we won. Uh, the Sheraton business based on this campaign. And it, it came out of the idea that um, we could be the uh, hotel, the, the business hotel that takes care of the people who take care of business. Because I always felt that, you know, when you're traveling and you're busting uh, your butt, it's nothing, there's nothing worse than coming across people who don't care. And I came up with this strategy because nobody else had one. And... Uh, the creative team did a terrific job of bringing this to life in an emotional way. Can you guys read that? 
There was another one. Um, we did this campaign for York peppermint patties. Um, York had always talked about Get the Sensation, and it was an iconic brand, but they were doing very traditional work with showing cross sections of the patty with the icing and the chocolate and stuff. And we said, we don't really need to do that. People know what you are, they know what you look like. So we just reinforced getting the sensation in a more, in a less traditional way. <laughs> Um, but sometimes dreams can turn into nightmares, and that's what happened with my dream job. But uh, I left DDB for McCann Erickson, and I had the very long-winded title of Executive Vice President North America and Senior Creative Director Worldwide. But I added the unofficial title of Worldwide CD on UPS when I discovered that they didn't really have a dedicated creative director on their international business that was run out of the McCann London office. So that was very creativepreneurial of me. Um, here's a campaign we did for, or an ad we did for UPS. Um, globally, it wasn't quite as well known as it is in the States, so sometimes just to say that they deliver globally was a big message for them. And we created a spot um, that was based on their training manuals. Hello! Hello! At UPS, we don't just go by the book, we go beyond it. UPS. <laughs> well, things were going great at McCann until Interpublic, the holding company, decided to take the UPS international business and move it to another Interpublic agency. And there was this uh, major accounting scandal that I had nothing to do with, but it did cause massive layoffs around the world. And uh, including among those was the worldwide CEO who had to take responsibility for it. So at least I was in good company. And my career kind of became a bit of a roller coaster after that. Um, I freelanced. I took a job at Saatchi and Saatchi for a massive, well, not a massive, but a substantial pay cut. And I ran not one but two of PNGs, uh, what they call billion dollar brands, uh, Crest and Imes. And, um, but you know, you do what you gotta do. And in fact, had I not taken the job, I never would have really connected with Todd, and I probably never would have started Grok. So, and then after a few years, I made my way back to Ogilvy, New York, got my salary back up, and then again, you know, uh, there were layoffs that were inevitable, inevitable in, in the economy. But when that happened, um, you know, I was, it was in 2007, I was 50 years old, and talk about having a midlife crisis. And I remember thinking to myself, I need to make this the best thing that ever happened to me. And that brings me to my final thoughts. It took a while, um, it was stressful financially and emotionally, but thanks to my family, uh, friends, uh, my colleagues, uh, Todd and Julie, the, the Grok stars, we call them, who work at the company, past and present, I was able to actually make one of the worst things that ever happened to me one of the best. And I'd like to end with a quote that I'll call the Creative Preneur's Credo. And it's not from Steve Jobs or Mark Cuban, and it's definitely not from Donald Trump. It's very good, I think it's very good career advice, which is actually even more amazing considering that it was written about 2,000 years ago. So if I'm not for myself, who will be? But if, if I'm only for myself, what am I? And I think some of us know some words for people like that. And if not now, when? So thank you. And if there are any questions that I didn't even, that I didn't ask myself yet, um, <laughs> feel free. Questions? Oh, sorry. You, you do it. Have you written down your parents' story? Um, 
not the way I really should have. It's something I would like to do more. I, I'm collecting snippets of it, but I haven't really sat down and, and wrote something. Yes? Would you say that the connections that you had before you started your company is why your company is so successful? Well, they weren't all my connections, but yes, I mean, a lot of times it's really kind of who you know and, and networking with people. And also, by starting to make little connections, they lead to others. So, for instance, we brought in, uh, I, I run into um, a creative person who I brought in to work on a digital assignment on VMware. And one of the people who worked in that company was the sister of the CEO of Zycam. And when the sister knew that Zycam was looking for an agency, she said to her sister, hey, you know, we're working with this nice little company, Grok. Maybe you should check them out. And that's how we got into the consideration set for Zycam. So yeah, you never know where connections will lead. And particularly today, when it's so easy to stay networked and connected, you almost have to aggressively not do it. You know, so yes, connections matter. Do you think your unique approach is what makes your um, like ideas so marketable and um, so widespread and award-winning? Well, I, I don't really think of of what I do as comedic. Although there is humor in it, and I think humor is an important you know way to to connect with people. Um, certainly, like the Ad Council campaign wasn't comedic, but, but it was emotional and it was, it was powerful. So I think what you have to do in communications is you have to be sensitive to the kind of messaging that's appropriate for that client. Um, you know, if you're, uh, there's a great quote from John Cleese where he says, too often in business people confuse being solemn with being serious. So you can have a serious message and you can have a touch of humor because it helps people understand that you know you know what they're what they're feeling and talking about. So that's why I think humor kind of can break the ice. So yes. Yes. You've been affected by a lot of cuts and changes in the economy where people were laid off. Yes. Um, you've been, your company has been in business for about ten years now. Seven. Seven. Okay. Have you been, have you uh, been forced to make any cuts? Um, that's a good question. We haven't had to make cuts for economic reasons. Um, there are people who have left to, you know, because it's a very transient business. So the people who have left, and we may not have replaced them because we felt, you know what, we can actually, we don't need to replace them. So, um, but we haven't made any economic cuts yet. Fingers crossed that we don't have to. Yes. Okay. Um how important is it in, um, basically, I saw in a bunch of the ads, like there was a trend where you tar particular target like women, especially the Zycom um, ads. So I'm asking, basically, how important is it? And also, like, what would you recommend like for business students? Um, most of business students here that are interested in, um, advertising who doesn't really have the art aspect, I could say. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, are you are you asking me if you're not if you if you want to get into advertising but not in the quote unquote creative yeah. area, how do you go about doing that? Well, I mean, a lot of the entry level jobs for outside of writers and art directors can be account work, there's strategy. So, um, you know, there are internships where you just kind of get thrown into an ad agency and um, you get exposed to different parts of that, of that agency world. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's media, there's account management, there's strategy. Um, some companies, some of the larger companies even have training programs. So, it's a matter of identifying who those agencies are. Again, you can do that online very easily. Uh, you go to Ad Age, Ad Week, see the list of agencies, see the kind of work you like, and start reaching out and finding out who in that community may be associated with that company, and start sending resumes and trying to have what I would call, what, what's called, informational discussions. Yes. 
could you go back to that idea of resiliency and, and talk a little bit more about that? Uh, because in today's day and age, uh, the, uh, you know, people run into blocks, particularly the kind of student body that, that we happen to have here at Concordia. And I think that's an important message for our students to hear that success doesn't come at the first knock. Um, and, and how do you remain resilient? Well, that's the, that's the big question because, um, you know, they, there's story after story about whether it's athletes, whether it's business people. Um, more often than not, businesses fail. Uh, com people fail. Um, you know, you talk about Michael Jordan, he said, He's, he's missed more shots than he's gotten. So you have to keep swinging. Otherwise, I mean, unless you're a trust fund kid, and great, God bless you, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're not, um, the difference between success and failure is just gonna be, if you're the one who just keeps coming back, you're gonna have an advantage because that's more often than not the way it happens. You just can't give up that easily because there's always somebody who has it worse than you do. And, um, you know, really, as long as you know, somebody's not out to kill you, what do you have to really complain about? So, you know, you just have to kind of keep at it. And, and you know, I mean, Concordia, it's, it's not like, you know, maybe it's not Harvard or maybe it's not Yale, but that's no guarantee of success graduating from those schools. I know plenty of people who, um, you know, aren't any more successful than people who went to state schools or, or you know, not the famous schools. So you can't let outside circumstances affect it. You have to really say to yourself, you know, why can't I succeed as much as somebody else? Why not me? And I, I'm serious, the, the, you know, the 2,000 year old quote is as relevant today as it was back then. So just can't stress enough, just got to stay in the game. I mean, even Woody Allen says 99% of success is showing up. <laughs> Yes. I, I think um, something that's interesting is like as um, a couple of us are getting ready to graduate and go out into like this job world, would you say that it is really important to believe in yourself and your ideas and not feel like just because you're new or you're just showing up to a job that you have nothing to offer or that you won't be or that you will be able to eventually have something to offer? Well, again, okay, that's a very good question. I mean. <clears throat> When you're starting out, um, you, do, you do have something to offer. Actually, I'm gonna, I was going to answer it one way, but thinking about it, when we hire young people at Grok, we're looking for people who can do as much for us as we can do for them. It's mutually. It's a mutual um, relationship. Because there are things about technology, there are things about the world. Young people offer a perspective that I'm never going to have. So, as an employer, you have to be open to other ideas, whether they're coming from a young person or not. So, and the young people have to say, you know what, I have to go to this company or work for people who are, gonna, who are going to give me something that I don't have. The worst thing is when you have young people who feel like they know everything and they're entitled and there's nothing that anybody's going to teach them because they went to this school or that school or they have this degree and they, you know, that's the worst thing you do. And we've come across some of those people and when they left, those are the people we, we, we did not replace because we don't want them there. They're just, they're destructive. So, you know, you, you have to kind of give yourself enough credit to think that, you know what, I'm good, I have something to offer. And at the very least, and I said this a couple of times in my talk, at the very least, you have to have the confidence to think you're not going to be the worst person who's showing up for an interview. Because there's always somebody who's going to be worse. You can't, I mean, at the, <laughs> at the very least, give yourself that, you know? Okay, well, let's uh, Just one, give a big round oh, of applause. Okay. Thank you. That I'm looking forward to Gill next uh, next month, but but I also think it's interesting for students um, and for us. It's like this is a really inspiring uh, story of ups and downs, of creativity, 
of going forward. That's the bottom line is going forward. And uh, questioning why there was maybe a step backwards. I really liked it when you referenced um, you back when you were a student said, I don't feel as though I'm getting better. So you changed your route. Um, and that's important. So, um, you know, please, there's more coffee and things left. And, and I'm sure students stay, stay around for just a couple of minutes. Sure. And thanks to everybody again. We really appreciate it. Thank you.